Okay, folks, time for Greek art part two. This time we're going to be focusing on architecture and architectural sculpture. And we are going to be spending our entire time in one very particular place in ancient Greece, and that is the Acropolis in Athens. And I just want to remind you that the outburst of architectural and artistic activity that we find happening in the fifth century BCE on the Acropolis of Athens does not happen by accident, but happens in a very particular historical context. The Athenians were the leaders of the Delian League, this sort of anti-Persia defense league that was founded after the Second Persian War. But around 449, a peace treaty was signed with Persia. And even though the Athenians continued to exact tribute from their allies in the Delian League, they didn't really have to earmark quite as much of that money for military purposes. So they end up using quite a bit of that money. And by the way, at this point, the Delian League treasury is in Athens. They start using a lot of that money to rebuild the Acropolis, which had been devastated during the Persian Wars. And so uh, the Athenians are sort of using these Delian League funds to create a monument to Athens' own glory. And um, I just want to mention that because, you know, everything is connected. This is one of the points of the humanities program. Uh, wars are connected with art. Uh, things that we don't normally sort of put together uh, do affect one another. So um, I want to start today, and we'll spend actually most of our time, talking about really sort of the crown jewel of the whole Acropolis, which is the Parthenon. Now, the Parthenon you were looking at right now, it's actually not in Athens, Greece, but rather in Nashville, Tennessee. Some of you, I'm sure, have been there. There is a complete, full-scale, concrete reproduction of the Parthenon in Music City, USA. If you are ever in town, it is certainly worth the $5 or whatever it costs to go in. Um, I showed you this partly because, as you all know, the, the Parthenon in Greece today is uh, not fully intact. It looks like this. Um, and that's not just time, by the way, there was a, there was a terrible sort of gunpowder explosion there in the 17th century. Um, what is the Parthenon? Let's start with that. It was a temple. It was a religious building for Athena, who, of course, is the sort of guardian deity of Athens, right? Athens, Athena. Parthenos in Greece means a young woman or maiden and was a reference to Athena. All right, the, the Parthenon, I think, tells us quite a lot about Greek aesthetic values. That's aesthetic, A-E-S-T-H-E-T-I-C, aesthetic, uh, which means having to do with, with beauty. You know, what, what did the Greeks find beautiful? What did they find appealing to the eye? And one of the things that we see is that um, the Greeks had a great love, I'll go back and look at this image, uh, a great love of simplicity. I mean, whatever one wants to say about the Parthenon, it is not, in terms of geometry, it is not a terribly complex building. It is basically, uh, you know, a rectangle or, you know, a sort of a rectangle within a rectangle. Um, and inside, there were just two basic spaces. So that inner inner temple was, was basically uh, sort of divided in half. So, you know, unlike some of the cathedrals we'll be looking at towards the end of our class, this is the kind of building that your eyes can rest on for just a second, and you can sort of instantly take in the, the, the basic design and geometry. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not a complex or subtle building in other ways. 
One of the other things that the Parthenon reveals is the Greek love of mathematics. We talked about this a little bit with Polykletos's canon, which he thought was sort of the key to getting the human body right. Scholars who have studied the Parthenon have found in a number of different places in the building, this nine to four ratio played out again and again. So nine to four, almost two to one, but not quite. So if you measure uh, the top step width versus length, you get nine to four. If you study, uh, if you measure the central axis of one column uh, to uh, the, the, um, the central axis of uh, the neighboring column, you get the same kind of ratio. Uh, the height of each column versus the width of the entire temple, you get a nine to four ratio. The Greeks loved mathematics. They thought that mathematics was the key to uh, unlocking the order in the universe and unlocking beauty as well. So if you look at a building like the Parthenon, you say, wow, geez, I could have designed that, you know, a, a big rectangle with columns going all the way around it. Just be aware that um, there's a kind of subtlety there that does not immediately meet the eye. But again, simplicity, harmony, unity, these are the things that the Greeks really value, the things they really valued in their art, and the Parthenon is a tremendous example of those things. Now, the Parthenon is also a tremendous example of one of the two major architectural orders of the classical uh, period. The order that the Parthenon exemplifies is the Doric order. The other one we'll talk about in a minute is the Ionic. Now, let's say you're in Greece, or let's say you're in Washington, D.C., for that matter, and you're looking at a sort of classical style building, and you want to know, is this Doric or Ionic? The first thing to look at are the columns. The columns most often are going to tell the story. And the first thing to look at are the capitals of the column. So that's the very top part of the column, which in this case is basically rectangular. And Doric columns, that's what they look like. They're, they're, they're rectangular, they are plain, they are unadorned. By the way, there are several architectural terms that are on your study guide this week. Capital is one of them. You may just want to sort of have your study, always a good idea to have your study guide out while you're watching these things. And uh, you might just want to pay close attention so that um, uh, you, you get each of these terms down pat. And by the way, th the effort that you take to learn these terms will be repaid because we're going to be using these terms uh, not only all throughout this course, but if you take 102 or 201, you'll we'll be using these these same terms. Okay, um, so what else? Well, again, if you look at the columns of the Doric, they tend to be pretty stout with a slight kind of bulge. Uh, in the middle, which kind of gives them like almost a muscular feel. And I think you can tell from this slide that there is no base for the column. The, the, the bottom of the column rests directly on the top step, okay? Last thing to look at, and this is another study guide term, look at that rectangular band that runs sort of horizontally above the columns not the one that's immediately above it, but right before it, and, and what you'll see, right above it. And what you'll see is an alternation, an alternation of a kind of square area with some sculpture, and then uh, three vertical lines. So I hope, I hope you can see that. Um, but that rectangular band, that horizontal rectangular band is known as a frieze, F-R-I-E, Z-E, a freeze. 
And this is not something peculiar to the Doric order. All the orders are gonna have friezes, although their friezes will vary. And as you can see here, the frieze of a Doric building has these alternating, what are called metopes, M-E-T-O-P-E. -E. They're either left plane or they're sculpted. So alternating metopes with triglyphs triglyphs, which get their name from those three vertical lines. We'll, we'll go back and look at a metope in just a little bit. Okay, so Parthenon, Doric. But on the Acropolis, there are two other buildings that we're going to look at. And both of these are examples of the Ionic order. Oh, uh, before moving on, I wanted to show you this. This is um, this is again from Nashville. Okay, so this is a reconstruction. But this gives you an idea of the sheer size of the statue of Athena inside the Parthenon. You can see that the guy standing there at the base, right? Um, so, uh, uh, again, a reminder that this is a, a temple for Athena. Now, most of the decoration is on the outside, and that's a very Greek tendency uh, on, on temples. You really decorate the outside. The inside, uh, you know, have a statue of some sort, but is otherwise rather plain. Okay. Um, so here you can see a, a close up of the metope and the triglyph. D don't worry uh, about some of those other terms on there. Again, you don't need to know all of them. The study guide will show you what you need to know and what you don't. Um, and if I, if I, and correct, here it's Metope, Freeze, Capital. Okay, those are the three you need to know, Metope, Freeze, Capital. All right, so Ionic, right? Moving on to the Ionic order. And again, this is a little bit of a cheat, but hey, I do it, so it wouldn't be right for me to, to deprive you of this. Just immediately look at the capitals of the columns. What do the capitals of the columns look like? If they're fancy and scroll-like, like what you see here, then most likely it is going to be uh, an Ionic building. Um, on the Acropolis, one of the best examples is the Temple of Athena Nike. Obviously, Athena, kind of a big deal, right? She gets two separate temples on the Acropolis. Uh, but you can already see a couple of the uh, differences here from the Parthenon, obviously the capital, but also look at the bottom of the column. They don't rest directly on the top step. There's this kind of molded um, base that they rest on, which then in turn rest on the top step. So that's another clue that you're dealing with Ionic rather than with Doric. Also, if you look at the frieze, since you now know what a frieze is, notice that there are no alternating triglyphs and metopes. It's just a continuously sculpted frieze. That, again, is an ionic characteristic. One other prominent building on the Acropolis, which is also an ionic building, is the Erechtheum. Okay. Um, and I've got a diagram here of the Acropolis, just so you can kind of get a sense of where these buildings are in relation to one another. You would come up, by the way, you would not go to the Acropolis on an everyday kind of basis. This is a special sacred precinct that Athenians tended to visit on special occasions. So you would come up these stairs, pretty steep climb, come up through the gate, go through the Propylaea. You see that on the left there. And then, um, and actually, even before you do that, you would see sort of the Temple of Athena Nike hard on your right. Then once you've passed through the Propylaea, uh, very prominent sort of on your right would be the Parthenon. And then you see the Erechtheum. Here it says Erechtheon, goes by either name, uh, on your left. So that just kind of gives you a sense of where things are in relation to one another. But going back to the Erechtheum, again, it's an Ionic building. But uh, I think it's probably most famous, not for its ionic columns, but for these caryatids. A caryatid is a, you know, a sculpture of a young woman that, that functions as a pillar that actually has a, you know, a low bearing 
function there. And clearly they're designed to sort of resemble pillars with their, uh, you know, the folds of their drapery and so on. Uh, so caryatids, caryatid is um, a term on your study guide. So I think that means we, we've covered all but one of your study guide terms and we'll be coming to that in just a moment. So the caryatids actually are a nice segue from sort of architecture per se, which is what we've been focusing on so far to architectural sculpture. So sculpture either attached to works of architecture or sort of nestled within them in some way. And by the way, looking ahead to your essay question, uh, we are gonna look at two works of architectural sculpture here and either one of those or both would be fair game for your essay question, just saying. Okay. Architectural sculpture. This is from the outer Doric frieze of the Parthenon. It is a Lapith. A Lapith was one tribe of Greeks. And that, so that's the Lapith there on the left. And on the right is a centaur, half man, half horse. This is, by the way, a good example of a high relief sculpture. Relief sculpture is any sculpture that is still attached to the, the flat surface out of which it's carved. Um, but what makes this high relief is that it is projecting far out of the surface. It's still attached, but it almost looks like it might not be. Um, and high relief sculpture really kind of creates a dramatic play of light and shadow. Uh, it also can be seen easily from afar. So this is why um, it works really well where it does on the Parthenon frieze, because even before you get very close to the, the building itself, you could probably make out these sculptures quite well. Um, the story, by the way, that's being depicted here is that a group of Lapiths were having a a wedding and a bunch of centaurs got drunk at the wedding and started trying to, to rape a bunch of people. A typical Greek story and then, you know, big fight kind of breaks out. Uh, now, I just want to very briefly mention the other four Doric friezes of the Parthenon and the stories that they tell. So on one side, uh, I believe it's the south side, you have the Lapis and the centaurs. On another side, you have the famous story of the Trojan War, so Greeks versus Trojans. On another side, you have um, the Titans versus the Olympians, the Titans being the old gods, the Olympians being the younger gods, who were, of course, the gods that the Greeks worship. Uh, and then on the fourth side, you have the Greeks versus the Amazons. And so in each case, you've got either the Greeks themselves or their gods, the Olympians, um, fighting against enemies and enemies that sort of represent almost sort of irrational or subhuman kinds of um, figures. And this is especially true with the centaurs um, or with the, the titans. And the message here, of course, is, is one that... Uh, uh, really glorifies the Greeks, uh, this idea that uh, the Greeks represent um, the best of humanity. The Greeks represent um, the force of, of, of rationality in some way. Um, and so with each of these struggles, the Greeks represent the forces of order and their enemies represent the forces of chaos. And of course, in each case, um, that the, the forces of order end up prevailing. Okay, now we finally get to that last study guide term, which is pediment. A pediment is a triangular space um, found above sort of often you know, the short end of the building, the wide end of the building, above the frieze, okay? And in the Parthenon, as well as in other buildings, you would find sculpture there, not relief sculpture, but actual freestanding sculpture, which was just sort of inserted into that uh, recessive space. 
Um, so that's what a pediment is. And the particular pedimental sculpture group I want to talk about is uh, the, the, the birth of Athena. This is a kind of reconstruction of what the original pedimental group might have looked like. So you've got uh, Athena, you know, who has just sort of popped out of Zeus's head, fully formed. I do want you to pay special attention to that group of three women on the right, okay? Because we're about to look at them um, right now, okay? So what we're looking at now is the actual original marble sculptures, obviously damaged. And rather controversial, controversially, these are found in London at the British Museum, not in Greece. The Greeks are not happy about that. Um, but uh, this is a really striking group. When you watch the classical ideal video, there's gonna be some analysis of uh, these three women, probably three goddesses. And, I hardly need to point out to you that, that what's most striking about this particular ensemble is the use of drapery, hyper-realistic, dramatic drapery. That's not only lifelike, but also uh, is sort of transparent to the underlying anatomy. Um, and so, these sculptures, these Parthenon pedimental marble sculptures are often cited as the, the acme of sort of naturalism, realism in classical Greek sculpture. And of course you have not just the naturalism of the drapery and the anatomy, but you have the variety of postures. You have you know, these individual figures that are kind of seated in different ways. So the sculptor's really you know, given himself quite the challenge and, and executed it superbly. Uh, but again, of course, this whole group is not surprisingly a, a celebration and glorification of Athena, uh, the, the namesake of the city of Athens. All right, I believe that wraps things up. See you next time.